Act 12-65 hours 49 minutes 8 seconds Madho Karaya had fallen into a pitch black dream. He could see nothing. He could hear nothing. Only his skin could feel the shockingly dense pressure of the darkness. Where, is this, here seemed to be inside someone's body. Therefore, Karaya asked the darkness, who are you? As if with a suffocating pressure, the darkness rumbled low. Like the angry roars of stormy winds, like the sky had fallen and the earth had cracked. I am, the alienated, the ridiculed, the despised. The dense black shadow that moved within the darkness was like a human shape poised to attack. The bones and skull immersed in the pitch darkness. The pair of bright eyes even more terrible than the darkness. Berserker, the manifestation of Madokaraya's curse, no, the servant his hatred had called from the ends of time. No need to praise my name, no need to envy my body, I am the shadow under the radiance of heroic spirits, birth of the darkness of glorious legend. Like a miasma that rose forth from underground, the sound of sighs of hatred wrapped around Karaya from every direction. Karaya began to feel uneasy, just as he was about to turn his gaze, the icy touch of metal gauntlet gradually neared, catching mercilessly on Karaya's clothes. Thus was Karaya's thin body lifted into midair, before Berserker's eyes, he was fixed in a position where he could not but meet that crazed gaze. And so, I hate, I resent. Nourished by the sighs of the people precipitated within the darkness, people that curse the light. Karaya struggled against the gauntlets mercilessly locked around his throat, groaning in pain. In his eyes, yet appeared another indistinct and confused scene. A sword shining bright light, and holding on to the hilt, a radiant young warrior. This person was not a stranger to Karaya. That was the Einsburn servant, Saber. This is my disgrace. Because of her unsullied glory, I must forever be belittled, the Black Knight's helmet cracked apart. The face revealed was shrouded in darkness, but that pair of fiery eyes, and the teeth trembling from hunger, could be clearly seen. You are, the sacrifice, he pronounced coldly, embracing Karaya without another word, coldly flashing sharp teeth piercing into his jugular. Karaya screamed in agony. But this scream could not move the other. The berserk black knight sucked at the blood seeping from Karaya's throat, and swallowed heavily. Good, give me more, your blood and flesh, your life, let them ignite my hatred. No. Stop. Save me. Karaya used all the words he could think of to beg forgiveness, hoping there would be someone to extend a helping hand, but in this darkness, it was impossible for him to obtain salvation. A miasma of red flashed intermittently before his eyes. Consciousness confounded by pain and fear gradually becoming foggy. But he still squeezed out the last remaining bit of strength, and cried out in his loudest voice. Waking with a pained cry, he was still within the darkness. But even thus, the stench of rotting given out by the ice cold and damp air, as well as the hair raising sound emitted by thousands of worms crawling, still told him clearly, this was, without question, the real world. The dream of just now compared to reality, exactly which world seemed more merciful to Karaya, at least, from the one fact of being able to forget that this body was about to die, perhaps remaining in the world of nightmares would be happier. By exactly what miracle he, burned and having fallen from the rooftop of a building, had been saved, and how he had returned to the underground worm storage of the Mata residence again alive, was now impossible to understand through his memory alone. His limbs felt dulled but he knew that he was chained to a wall, his hands shackled. He could not stand on his own feet, his shoulders, supporting the weight of his entire body, hurt as if they were about to be torn from their sockets. But compared to the itch of the worms covering his body, it was not even worth mentioning. The worms licked at burnt skin, and under that skin was new skin colored pink. It looked as if the burns were currently healing, though the reason was unknown. It looked as if the crest worms intended to use Karaya's body as a seedbed to extend his life. But this was completely useless. In order to regrow the skin, Prana had already been forcibly consumed, the few days of life left in Karaya's body were also about to dry up. He could clearly feel that even the simple action of drawing a breath and then expelling it was depleting his strength. Very soon, 
he would die at the same time he understood that he was absolutely unable to put up resistance. Aoi and Sakura's faces were constantly flashing in his mind. He had once vowed to save them with his life as the price. But in the end, his wish had not been fulfilled. This disgrace and shame tortured Karaya's heart even more than the pain of his body. Remembering the faces of the people he loved, but immediately after, the indifferent expression of Tozaka Tokiomi and the sneer of Mato's Oken invaded his heart, pressed onto him until he could not breathe. Bastard! From the depths of his dry throat, Karaya cursed angrily with all the strength he had left. Bastard! 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 The sound of his sobs was suddenly muffled by a sound of pleasured laughter that came from behind him. The worm scurried to avoid the elderly and small silhouette propped up by a crutch and slowly walking closer to Karaya. It was none other but precisely the object of Karaya's hatred, Mato Zokin. Ah, Karaya, you are really quite pitiful like this. The elderly Magus used his crutch to poke at Karaya's jaw, forcing him to lift his head. Karaya no longer had the strength to rail at him but nevertheless used his remaining right eye to glare at the other with hatred and murderous intent. Just looking disdainfully at his opponent already exhausted him. Don't get it wrong, I'm not reprimanding you in any way. With such serious injuries, I'm surprised you came back here alive, Karaya, I don't know who it was that saved you. But luck does not seem to be bad in the battle this time around. Zoken, murmuring gently to his son as if caressing a cat, was in a particularly good mood today, thus the implication of evil was written all over his face that was full of smiles. Three servants have already been taken care of, only four remain. Truth be told, I did not think you could actually hold out till now. It looks as if, this gamble, I may still have a chance at winning. And like that, Zokin suddenly finished speaking, retreating a few steps to distance himself from him. Perhaps adding one more lock on you is not a bad idea. Ah Karaya, since things have come to this point I will pass on to you the trump card I have secreted away for this day, come on, Ku, Zokin's crutch suddenly pushed at the hollow of Karaya's throat, forcing him to open his mouth. Immediately after, it moved upward like a mouse, and was fiercely stabbed into Karaya's mouth. Ah, uh, uh. Karaya fainted from the pain. The worms followed the cavity of his mouth and mercilessly invaded his gullet, finally arriving within the spasming abdomen. Now, even if he had wanted to vomit, he could not, it was already too late. After a which, as if a red-hot block of metal had been placed into his stomach, an intense burning sensation grilled Karaya's body from the inside. Ah! Uh, Karaya began to struggle in agony, the cuffs on his hands jangled. The blood which seemed to have stagnated now boiled, run away, and his heart also pounded crazily, almost to the point of breaking apart. That had been a piece of concentrated prana. The crest worms within Karayo's body, which had temporarily regained vitality, began to move again. The mock prana circuits of Karayo's entire body also started to pulse like never before, and his limbs were beginning to feel pain as if they were being torn apart but this also meant that Karaya's numb arms and legs could feel again. Seeing the trump card take effect, Zokin jeered loudly. Huya, this does have immediate results. Do you know? That piece of prana you swallowed just now came from a lust worm. The one that first absorbed Sakura's innocence. How about that, Karaya? The vitality of a young girl, absorbed continuously over the course of this past year. It is the best magecraft energy of all. Yes. And perhaps it was this chain of cruel actions that satisfied his sadistic heart, the elderly Magus turned around, his face full of smiles. Just as he was about to leisurely leave the worm storage, his derisive mockeries once again pierced into Karaya's ears. Go forth and fight, Karaya. Burn up completely the life snatched from Sakura. Do not be stingy with your blood and flesh, but bring back the grail. If one like you can do it that is. After a which, with the heavy closing of the doors, the surroundings were once again only filled with icy darkness and the noise of crawling worms. Karaya began sobbing silently. Dash 64 hours 21 minutes 13 seconds the warm afternoon sunlight gently warmed the outer walls of the storeroom and gradually slanted towards the west. However, 
The air in the storeroom remained silent and cold. A few rays of sunlight shone in from the small skylight, as if bathing the storeroom in the soft dusk of afternoon. Saber was sitting on the ground with her back against the wall, waiting for the arrival of that time. In the magic circle beside her was Iris Veal, who still laid face up with her hands crossed across her chest. She was still deep asleep. Saber had, without moving, gazed at her sleeping profile ever since she brought her here this morning. Would the magic circle that Iris Veal and she drew together yesterday work as expected? For Iris Veal, who is a homunculus, it appeared as if resting in this magic circle is the only way of recovering. In the past, a ceremony would also be held with it. However, considering the current situation, it seemed to be a very distant and unreachable past. It was truly a long night. Castor, who hindered the battle and joined Midway, was finally defeated. And then, the duel with Lancer ended into a heartrending manner. The War of the Holy Grail made great advancements last night, with two servants leaving the battle. Saber could indeed be said to have played an extremely important part no matter what the situation of battle was. It would be a lie to say that she's not tired. But right now she was more worried about Iris Veal's situation. She recalled that they were already signed since morning. Iris Veal had called it a defect in the functions of a homunculus. However, Saber couldn't figure out just what had happened yesterday to make her body condition worsen so much. It wasn't due to wounds, nor did she undertake overly vigorous exercise. If this situation happened to the master that formally sealed a contract with Saber, then it's very probable that it was due to Saber's tiredness and the increase of the prana supply that increased the master's burden. But if that were the case then it shouldn't be Iris Veal, who is only a substitute master, but Kiritsugu instead. The gentle sunlight shone in through the skylight. As the time went past noon, the sunlight also slowly changed its angle. Finally, Iris Veal moved slightly. The still dare moved as if there were ripples stirred within. Saber immediately widened her eyes, and saw that Iris Veal was slowly sitting up as she moaned in anguish. Saber. Lazily brushing the silver strands of hair away from her eyes she looked at Saber, who guarded her side, with a lost gaze. Iris Veal, how are you doing? Um, millimeters. I'm fine now. That's impossible. Saber wanted to rebuke but she saw that the reddish color of Iris Veal's cheeks have returned to its normal healthy state. It's hard to believe that she was in a coma until now. Ah, she gave a small stretch, as if joyfully waking up in the morning after having fully rested. MMM, looks like I made you worry. N. No. It'd be great if it's really fine. But. MMM, I understand what you want to say, Saber. With a bitter smile. Iris Veal combed through her long hair with her hands, and tidied her clothes that have gone slightly messy. Looks like I really did have a lot of problems after I came here. It shouldn't matter if I just remain quietly like this, but, Saber, from now on, I may be unable to stay beside you and support you anymore. Iris Veal. Iris Veal said in a rather downcast manner. On the contrary, it made Saber a little surprised. Sorry. Although it's very embarrassing, but compared to becoming your burden, no, that's not it. I hope you'll be more careful with your body. It's all my fault. I feel like this is a reminder to me, saying that because I forced you to continuously participate in battles that you. Saber stopped, afraid that what she may say next could hurt Iris Veal. Iris Veal smiled weakly, and said. You don't need to worry about that. We homunculi are different from humans, and we understand the structure of our body very clearly. It's like a car, if a car doesn't flash a warning light when the gas runs out, then that's really what's called malfunctioning. Although those words were correct, the analogy wasn't fitting enough. Hearing this, Saber became silent with a gloomy face. Then, with a very serious gaze, she looked at Iris Veal with a frontal stare. Iris Veal. Although you are indeed a homunculus, but I never thought of treating you differently from ordinary humans. Therefore, no matter what, you don't need to speak so lowly of yourself. Saber said it so straightforwardly that Iris Veal conceded her defeat. Saber, you're so gentle. Everyone who got to know you would think this way. Iris Veal, 
You're a very charismatic person. In order for the conversation to stop being so heavy, Saber deliberately joked with a light tone. For a woman, her body would often have various discomforts. There's no need for you to be ashamed. With that, even Iris Veal gave a bitter smile of embarrassment. Speaking of that, Saber, you're also a girl, um, wouldn't it be problematic? You have to act as a man during such times. No, about that, seeing that Iris Veal's face has regained its usual smile, Saber relaxed, so she continued with a tone that's even lighter than usual. You wouldn't know it, but I had the extra protection of my noble phantasm when I was alive. Not to mention disease, even aging had stopped for me. Therefore, no discomforts would appear for my body. I'd still be like I am right now even ten years later. Then, Saber suddenly saw that Iris Veal's expression became anxious, as if she was in discomfort, so she quickly stopped. Although she couldn't understand how come this casual topic got Iris Veal so down, Saber discovered that currently Iris Veal was in no mood to chat with her. Anyways, Iris Veal, you don't need to worry about anything. Indeed, I would be more relieved with you covering me, but now not many enemies are left. Even if I act alone, I'll still have complete confidence in victory. Saber, if you truly act alone, then I won't worry either. Saber couldn't help but feel a bitterness welling up in her throat when she realized the true meanings of Iris Veal's words. Yes, she wasn't acting alone. The master that made a contract with the servant Saber was still on the same battlefield. Oi, Saber. From now on, will you be able to treat Kiritsugu as a comrade, and fight beside him? She wasn't able to answer immediately. This act showed the struggles within the King of Knights' heart blatantly. If all other masters seek the Holy Grail only due to their own selfish desires, then I believe the Grail should be obtained by Kiritsugu. I have no objection over becoming his sword due to that. As she answered with a subdued tone, Saber furrowed her brows as if she couldn't hide her distress. But I wish the only one who becomes a sword would be me. I don't want to once again intervene in Kiritsugu's methods. Saber's heart couldn't help but feel a throbbing pain as she recalled Diarmuid's end. No matter how much she understands the man called Kiritsugu, no matter how much a concession she's willing to make, Saber cannot forgive that scene no matter what. Now I need to perform battles that Kiritsugu has to agree with. As a servant, I can't obtain victory without staining the master's hands, can't I? The remaining three servants cannot win against me no matter what. Iris Veal nodded. She could only nod. It was already a miracle for Saber to retain such a fighting spirit after having witnessed Kiritsugu's despicable behavior with her own eyes. However, on the other hand, she also knew that right now Saber wanted very much for Kiritsugu to trust her at least minimally, but there was no possibility for Kiritsugu to do so. The meaning of the phrase true victory differed as drastically as heaven and earth between the King of Knights and the Magus Killer. Relying on her unyielding will to strive until victory is obtained and a perseverance that allows her to rise once again no matter how many times she's defeated, a prudence that completely eliminates all possible reasons that may cause his defeat, although their goals are both the same, their methods are fatally different. For me, the Holy Grail is like myself. Because from the moment I was born, I have the vessel that allows its descent. Hearing Ursa Veal's words, Saber nodded. I heard about it. Your duty is the guardian of the vessel. However, although Saber is with her 24 hours a day, she still does not know how and where she hid the vessel of the Grail. Since they trusted each other, then there's no need for her to ask. All Saber needs to do is to accept the vessel from her hands once she obtained victory in all battles. Therefore, no matter what happens, I hope that my treasure would be passed into the hands of those I love, Kiritsugu, and you, Saber. Iris Veal said, as if praying. Saber nodded resolutely. Back then, when I was first summoned, I already swore to protect you and obtain a final victory. I don't plan on going back on that oath. Iris Veal could only smile and nod ambiguously. If they were to fulfill the initial purpose of the three noble families of the beginning dash reaching Akasha, then command seals must be used to demand Saber, who has defeated all the servants, 
to kill herself and use all seven heroic spirits as sacrifices for the Holy Grail to end the war. However, what Hira's Vialan Kiritsugu entrusted to the Grail was no such wish. Although the wish of ending all conflicts and changing the world seemed immense, it does not leap out of the boundary of miracles at the end. The changes that occur according to its result would only happen within the world at the maximum. It is really too easy compared to the goal of reaching the root of all things that is outside the world. However, if they only want to fulfill a miracle in the physical world, then they wouldn't need the ancient lady of winter herself as the vessel to completely awaken the great grail. Enough prana would be replenished for Kiritsugu and Saber to fulfill their wish as long as they defeat the other six enemy servants. However, what Iris Veal was more worried about in the two's process of experiencing this cruel war of survival was, compared to the enemy's strength, what was more important was Kiritsugu and Saber's disagreement. As their ways of living and beliefs were the complete opposite, the conflicts between those two were unavoidable. Therefore, Iris Veal believed that she should do her best to soften the conflict between them. But regarding whether she can actually achieve that, actually, there was already no more hope. Because Iris Veal's body was already dash dash? Someone's presence is getting closer, Iris Veal. Saber's face was covered with alertness. Then, Iris Veal also detected the guest from the reaction of the bounded field established in the courtyard. Ah, uh, don't worry. This is Mia's presence. With a soft knock of the storeroom door, it was indeed Hisamiya herself who came in. She had her usual cold and dispassionate expression, and her icy cold beauty made Saber move her eyes away with some displeasure. Judging from her action of mercilessly shooting Lancer's two masters dead, she was indeed only cruelly and loyally executing Kiritsugu's plans. However, Saber found it very hard to agree to such an action. It was unknown whether Mian understood those inner thoughts of Sabres. Like always, she didn't greet them, nor did she say anything in a roundabout way, but cut into the main topic straight away. Tozaka Tokiomi sent a secret messenger. He got his familiar to bring a letter. Madam, it is for you. Secret messenger? After Iris Veal withdrew from Ayn's burned castle. It had become a dangerous house of traps under Kiritsugu's hand in order to make other unaware masters fall into the bait. Mio's bats were responsible for surveillance. Just then, a familiar, not a magus, had appeared there with documents. It was a jade bird. According to Kiritsugu's deductions, it should be a puppet that the Tozaka Magi habitually use. That's what I heard too. Then, where's the letter? Here, taking the note that Mio handed to her. Iris Vio began to read. All pleasantries and formalities were omitted on it, and the writer's intentions were written very simply and openly. That's to say, he petitions us to fight together. Iris Vio gave a snort of derision. Saber was the same. Just thinking about that archer's master's intentions made her annoyed. An alliance? Even now? Tozaka should feel very uneasy about how to deal with the remaining writer and berserker. He thinks we're the easiest to deal with, so he invited us to unite with him, that's to say, compared to the other two groups, we were belittled. The letter said that if Iris Veal is interested in a negotiation, then Tokyo Mi would humbly await at Fuayuki Church at midnight tonight. As the supervisor, the Holy Church should stay neutral. How did it agree to let him do this? That's because it appears that the supervisor, Father Raisa, is already dead. That is to say, the War of the Holy Grail has no supervisor this time. Hearing Mia's explanation, Iris Veal nodded with approval. Kiritsugu said that the relationship between Tozaka and the church had also been exposed with this. The supervisor, who supported him, died, so he began to change his plans in a hurry. Iris Veal, the opponent is the magus that controls Archer. I feel that we shouldn't trust him. Remembering her disgust towards that golden heroic spirit, Saber concluded with caution. I am at my optimum condition now my left hand had healed completely. I can single-handedly defeat Ryder and Berserker without a need of forging alliances. Of course, Archer is of no exception. Saber said, full of confidence. Iris Veal nodded first, but then crossed her arms with concern. Although what Saber said is true. But Tozaka has other things that can force us to concede. 
he has things we don't. Such as certain intelligences. Mu nodded upon hearing this. Indeed. For example, if Tozaka can get information about the whereabouts of the headquarters of Ryder's camp, then it's worth the risk of going into his trap and obtain this intelligence. Can that still be unknown? I didn't think such a kid would make it so troublesome for Kiritsugu. It's because Ryder and his master usually ride their high-speed flying noble phantasm, so it's impossible to follow them on land. My bats are also unable to match their speed, so we can never catch them. Concerning ways of hiding their trail, can they be even better than that Lord Del Meloy? Although it is surprising, we have checked all the locations within the entire Fuayuki area that Amagus may set up a workshop, but still didn't find Ryder and his master. Like Mia said, what troubled Kiritsugu the most at the moment was the search for Waver Velvet's headquarters. Although Amiya Kiritsugu knew well all the methods for Amagus to hide himself, he still couldn't have guessed that a master omitted even accommodation funds and boarded in civilian houses straight away. But what are the possibilities that Tozaka Tokyo may have such intelligences? Mia replied affirmatively. Tozaka Tokyo Mi had conducted various sorts of thorough preparations from the beginning of the War of the Holy Grail. The supervisor is a very good example, moreover, Mia paused when she reached this part, and discreetly gave a glance at Iris Veal's expression. She, who was silent, appeared to have thought the same as Mia. Moreover, we think that Tozaka is also controlling Assassin's Master, Kotami Kairai, in secret. If that man stands at a position that can influence Kotami and Kairai, then his invitation is still advantageous for us in some degree. Kotami and Kairai. It was the first time Saber heard this name, but she easily understood this man means very much to them just judging from the solemn and heavy expressions Iris via Landmu were wearing. Remember this, Saber. With an oddly stiff tone, Iris Veal said. In this war of the Holy Grail, if someone can defeat Kiritsugu and obtain the Holy Grail, then he must be this man called Kotami and Kairai. Kiritsugu said so himself. He had locked the goal onto this man named Kairai from the beginning. Mia and Iris Veal didn't say much. But even so, Saber still obtained a rather clear understanding of this man called Kotami and Kairai. Now that they spoke of it, Saber also recalled a mysterious attacker had hurt Iris Veal on Mia who was hiding in the castle, badly during the battle in the Einsburn forest. With a resolute tone, Iris Veal declared thus. Apart from the matter of alliance, there is the need to prod out what intelligences lay in Tozaka's hands at the moment. Let me go to Fu Iuki Church to confirm it tonight. Since such a clear command had been given, then Saber couldn't say much anymore. Moreover, she was also very attentive of the Kotami. If Kiritsugu can consider him as a nemesis, then he must need special attention without a doubt. Right, Saber. You have a job today too. Saber was rather confused when Mia suddenly called to her. Oh? Yes. Since you could skillfully drive that Mercedes, I've prepared a mechanical prop even more fitting for guerrilla warfare according to Kiritsugu's orders. Hearing this, Saber appeared to be interested. That's good. A machine that is more suitable to battle than a car is a very big help for me. It's parked outside right now. Take a look to see if you can use it. MMM, I'll go right now. Saber walked out of the storeroom with expectant and light steps. Mia watched her leave, expressionless as usual. However, she sighed within her heart for the fact that Saber appeared only as an ordinary girl no matter how one looks at it and it's absolutely impossible to discern that she was the king of knights, Artria, no matter what, ordinarily, Saber only appeared to be a rather mature short girl, no one would believe that she was indeed that king who made glorious victories during that battle ravaged time. It was rare for me to have such meaningless emotions for things apart from work. Just as she was about to mutter something to herself, which is rarer still, she heard something fall down beside her. Turning her head she saw that Iris Veal, who was sitting in the magic circle just now, was once again lying on the ground. Her state was very unusual. Sweat was pouring down her pallid face, her breathing was painful and fast. Ma, madam. What's wrong? Mia hurried up and took her in her arms. The slender body in her arms was abnormally hot. Did Saber. See this? 
Iris Veal asked bitterly, with no fear or shame in her tone. She seemed to have no questions about these sudden abnormalities happening to her body. Madam, your body, just what? He he, Mia's panicking face. Is actually. Rather cute. What are you talking about? Now's not the time to say this. I'll get Saber and Kiritsugu here immediately, please stay awake. Mia made to stand up, but Iris Veal reached out and pressed down on her shoulder. This isn't abnormal, this is, predetermined a long time ago. For the current me to continue existing as a human is already so lucky it seems miraculous. Sensing that there were deeper meanings in her words, Mia calmed herself. Although she was still nervous, she had recovered her usual cool. Does Kiritsugu also know? Iris Veal nodded, but she softly added a but. Saber. Does not know. She still has to face important battles. Don't let her worry about anything else. With a deep sigh, Mia once again let Iris Veal's body lie quietly face up within the magic circle. She knew this is the position for her, who is a homunculus, to fully rest. Should I also pretend that I don't know about this? No, Mia. I've got something to say to you. Is that all right? Mew nodded, stood up, and looked outside the storeroom. After she made sure Saber was no longer in the courtyard, she quietly closed the door and returned to Iris Veal's side. Okay, Saber can't hear us now. Iris Veal nodded, adjusted her rapid breathing, and said calmly. I am the homunculus designed for the heavens feel. You should know this. Yes. The guardian of the vessel, my duty is to manage and transport the vessel prepared for the Holy Grail's descent. Actually, that's not completely accurate. During the previous heavens feel, not only did Grandfather Eight lose his servant, the precious vessel of the Grail was also broken during to the war. In the third heavens feel, since the vessel was damaged before the victor was decided, the war was meaningless. That's when Grandfather began to reflect and decided to cover the vessel this time inside a humanoid shape that has a consciousness and can self-manage. Her nonchalant voice was as if she was leisurely recounting things that have nothing to do with her. It was probably because she's seen through everything that she had decided to speak out everything about her body. And that is, me. The vessel itself was granted the instinct to live. In order to dodge all sorts of dangers by itself, Grandfather made the vessel into Iris Veal. How can that be? Then, you. Mew's heart was not cold as a rock. She couldn't help but lose her composure when faced with the impact of this fact. Three servants have already deceased in battle, and the war would end very soon. The function of the vessel within me would begin to ceaselessly put pressure on this unnecessary outer appearance with the passage of time. In the future I would, gradually and without a doubt, become unable to move, until at last, Mia, I wouldn't even be able to talk you like this. Biting her lower lip, Mia was silent for a while, and she carefully repeated her previous questions once again. Does Kiritsugu really know everything? Does he know what kind of situation you're currently in? Yes, that's why he gave me Saber's scabbard. Avalon, all is a distant utopia. Do you know its abilities? The ability to stop aging and limitlessly heal the wielder, that's what I heard. It prevented the peeling off of my outer shell. I originally thought I'd be overcome very quickly, but thanks to it I can still maintain a human appearance and behave as such until now. Also, if I increase in distance from Saber like now, the situation would suddenly worsen. She was already unable to get up. Faced with Iris Veal, who seemed as if sunk into the edge of death. Mia couldn't help but lower her eyes. Mia cannot imagine what Saber's response would be had she been here. Rather than suffering herself, the girl who was the model of chivalry would be more distressed with others' pain. If she knew that the victory that she expected can only be achieved with Iris Veal's sacrifice as the prerequisite, it would be unknown whether she would still be able to grasp the holy sword like before. Why are you telling me this? Mia asked. Iris Veal only smiled peacefully. Hisalmia, you're the only one who won't pity me. You definitely agree with me. That's what I believe. Mia gazed at her smile silently, then nodded soundlessly. Madam, I, I had originally thought that you're someone who's very hard to be close to. No such thing, 
Can you understand me? Yes. Mu nodded without hesitation, showing her agreement. It was precisely because she was a woman who was born as a human but lived as a machine that she's able to express agreement to another woman who was made as a machine but faced her end as a human. Even if I were to give up this life of mine, Iris Veal, I would protect you till the end. Therefore, for Emilia Kiritsugu, please don't die. For the fulfillment of that man's dream. Thanks. Stretching out a shaking hand, Iris Veal grasped Hasamia's hand. Dash 62 hours 48 minutes 35 seconds The twin black eyes that stared at him from his chest level were like a pair of jewels. Yes, that was the truth, Tozaka Tokiomi once again felt it himself. This girl is the ultimate treasure that the Tozaka family obtained after five generations, a rare shining gem that equates to a miracle. Tozaka Rin. Although she was yet young, she was destined to become a beauty in the future judging by her looks. Rather than her mother's appearances, Rin had more similarities with Tokiomi's mother when she was young. The time was dusk, the veil of night has yet to fall. Arriving at his wife's house, Tokiomi, in front of the doors of the Zenjo house, did not plan to step inside. Right now, Tokiomi was one of the masters who seek the grail, and had long entered the realm of Shuris. In order to protect his wife and daughter, he had entrusted them to the Zenjos. This realm does not allow blood or gore to invade. With a nervous expression, Rin gazed at her father, who had called her out of the door but didn't speak a word. Her father didn't just come to see her, but arrived with something very important. Instinctively, the girl understood it this way. He had originally decided not to see his daughter until the end of the war. What made him waver was Father Raizai's sudden death last night. The old priest was his father's good friend and watched Tokiomi grow up. Under the secret pact sealed between the two parties, he was there to support Tokiomi's back. For Tokiomi, this was the biggest factor that made him have a sure confidence in winning. Of course, Tokiomi isn't someone who would be at a loss once he loses his backup. However, it is an indisputable fact that a dark cloud named Unforeseen had appeared on the road to victory that he had believed wholeheartedly until now. Just like how that experienced and stubborn priest had suddenly fell, his own confidence had also suddenly been cut in half. Till yesterday, the victory of the heavens feel had appeared to Tokiomi as something already in the bag. However, due to the death of his trustworthy companion, at this time he had also made the preparation to devote himself in the gunpowder-covered battlefield as a fighter. What if? This is the last time he talked to Rin? Faced with the young girl before him, what should he say? Rin swallowed, staring at her father, and waited for him to speak to her. Tokiomi knew the respect and longing his daughter had towards him, who is her father. He knew that what he said to his daughter today would definitely decide Rin's road from now on. No. There were no doubts for the future, it has all been decided long ago. Rin has no choice but to inherit the title of the sixth head of the Tozaka family. Perhaps it was because of this thought that Tokiomi now bore a little bit of guilt towards his daughter. He knelt down, and put his hand on Rin's head, at that time, Rin suddenly widened her eyes with surprise. Only when he saw his daughter's reaction did Tokiomi remember that he has never caressed his daughter's head like this before. It was normal for Rin to be shocked, too. Tokiomi also discovered, for the first time, that he didn't even know just how he should express his gentleness to his daughter. Rin. Put the association in your debt by the time you mature. I'll let you decide what to do after that. You should be able to take care of yourself. He originally had some doubts and didn't know what to say, but once he opened his mouth, he began to speak on and on. He had thought of many maybes, there were many things to be passed on. How to manage the treasures, that is, jewels, in the house, and the rules of the basement workshop that was inherited from the great teacher, all such things, Tokiomi focused on key points and recounted to Rin, who was intently listening. Although there were no crests, but in truth, it was equal to having Rin appointed as the head of the Tozaka house for the next generation. On a side note, Tozaka Tokiomi was definitely not a genius. Compared with the members of the Tozakas through the generations, his talents are mediocre at best. 
The reason that the Tokyo Mi right now is a skilled and respected magus was largely due to the fact that he had always loyally obeyed the family creed. That was why he could always be confident and elegant, if he wanted to achieve a tenfold result, then he must give out twentyfold of practice. Elegantly and composedly pass all sorts of cruel training, that had become Tokyo Mi's creed. If one has to find something about him that's better than others, then maybe it would only come down to the two things of complete self-control and a will of self-restraint. His father, who was both his teacher and the previous head of the household, should already have fully foreseen just what a hard journey his son would embark upon if the son had the way of magicraft as his ambition. Therefore, when his forebear passed the magic crest on to Tokiomi, he had repeatedly asked his son Dash will you inherit the family business? These questions are merely very ritualistic, and it's only for a show too. As the only son, what Tokiomi had been taught since childhood was an education of how to become a leader. This pride that was nurtured since his childhood made him have no other dreams in his life. Even so, this method of asking was still used, that is, Tokiomi still has an incomplete ability to choose. Now that he thought back, for Tokiomi, this was the best gift that his father gave him as the previous head of the family. Tozaka Tokiomi decided to enter the way of Mudgecraft through his own will, and decided not to be swayed by fate. It was indeed this preparation that gave Tokiomi an iron will. What supported him through the days of merciless, strict practices ever since then was indeed this proud overconfidence of this is the way of life I chose for myself. If only he would be able to pass the treasure that he got from his father onto his daughter, Tokiomi thought sadly. However, that was already impossible to be achieved. For Rin and Sakura, there were no choices for them in the first place. One of them has all elements having five multiple elements as her alignment. The other has no elemental alignments, having imaginary numbers only. Both sisters have a rare potential that can be equated to miracles. This had surpassed the limits of so-called natural talents or inborn skill, it is almost like a curse. A magical nature would equally gather magical powers to it. Prominent people who are far outside the rules inevitably gather equally extraordinary experiences. This cannot be controlled by the person's own will. There is only one way to deal with this kind of a destiny, consciously walk away from the rules yourself. Apart from understanding and practicing the way of magicraft themselves, there are no other ways to deal with the magical powers hidden in the blood of Tokiomi's daughters. Moreover, the protection of the Tozako house can only be endowed on one of them. This fact tormented Tokiomi for a long time. The one who did not become the inheritor would get mired in all kinds of odd evens due to her own blood, and trouble bound find her. If the association found this kind of ordinary humans, those guys would definitely gladly put her in formaldehyde as a specimen in the name of protection. Precisely because of that, it was nothing better than a godsend for the motto house to hope to have Sakura as their adopted daughter. He had obtained the way to have both his beloved daughters inherit first class magecraft unconstrained by their bloodline's consequence, and carve out their own lives. At that time, Tokiomi could be said to be freed from the heavy burden of being a father. But can it really be achieved? Dash Tokiomi didn't even have that confidence. This question continued to torment him. With Rin's talents, she should find it to be easier to understand the mysteries of the way of Mudgecraft than Tokiomi. Therefore, compared with embarking on this road through a choice of his own will, what a painful thing it would be if she tries to escape her destiny but still ends up on this path at the end. If he is unable to give any guidance on the trials that Rin will face and just disappear like this, would such a Tozaka Tokiomi count as a fitting father? As if questioning the confusion in his heart, Tokiomi once again condensed all his thoughts into the hand he had put on Rin's head. Rin let his large hand caress her head, but her jet black eyes remained gazing, unmoving at her father. There was not a sliver of anxiety or doubt in that look. Ah, really? This unconditional relevance and trust finally brought answers for Tokiomi. There was no need to apologize to this child, nor worry about her future path. Faced with the proud child of the Tozaka family, the previous generation, who was about to pass away, no longer needs to entrust anything else, Rin, the Holy Grail will appear eventually.
it is our duty as the Tozaka family to win it. More importantly, if you want to be a Magus, you can't avoid it. The girl nodded adamantly. Her eyes made pride fill Tokiomi's chest. Tokiomi did not feel this kind of pride even when he inherited the position as the head of the family. I'll have to get going now. You know what to do now, right? Yes, take care, father. Rin answered resolutely with a clear voice. Tokiomi nodded and stood up. Lifting his head, he cast one look inside the house and happened to catch the eyes of Aoi, who was standing by the window and peering out. Trust and encouragement was in his eyes. And thankfulness and reassurance was in her eyes that responded to him. Just like that, Tokiomi turned his back on his wife and daughter, and left the Zenjo house without a backward glance. Confusion is a shadow created from a restless heart. That is far from elegance. Remember the family cred in your heart, Rin Sai told him that once again. If he still had regrets towards his daughter, then, it must be his failure and the self that cannot fulfill his long-cherished wish through the Holy Grail. If he wants to become a father that can lift his head up high and proudly puff out his chest in front of Rin, then Tozaka Tokiomi must become a perfect and flawless magus. Only then, can he complete the Majcraft heart of the Tozaka family with his own two hands. He must become a father who's fit to teach and guide his daughter, a truly perfect father. With a brand new decisiveness, Tozaka Tokiomi embarked on his return journey in the dusk. Once again towards Fuayuki. Soon, the veil of the night would descend. Dash 58 hour 16 minutes 21 seconds regarding the midnight meeting at the Fuayuki church. Tozaka Tokiomi had naturally defined the number of people allowed to attend in the conditions. Apart from the respective master and servant, both sides can also bring along the supporter. For Iris Veil, who found it difficult to act alone, she never expected such a condition to exist. It would be impossible for her to rely on Saber's strength if she happens to accidentally be caught in a battlefield later on. If Mia happens to be beside her at that time, she would be much more at ease. Of course, as the reciprocal condition, one other person also attended apart from Tozaka Tokiomi and Archer, at the end, when Tokiomi introduced that follower to Iris via Lan the others as if it was nothing important, they couldn't help but change their expressions a little. Let me introduce him, Kotami Kairai, my student. Although he was also someone who competed with all of you, it was in past. He had lost his servant and had given up the rights of a master for a long time. Is that all? Iris Vio cast a dubious look at the other man, but Tokiomi was full of calmness and appeared not planning to say much else. Maybe he was underestimating the opponent. If not, then he may still be unaware of the feud between Iris via Lan Kotami and Kairai. Saber, leisurely reclining against the wall behind Tokiomi and the others, glared unblinkingly at the red-eyed servant. Tonight, Archer had also removed his battle arrays and put on a set of ordinary clothes suitable to this era. Although the outfit, decorated with leather and lacquer, looked like it was full of a distasteful glamour, it did not create any incongruities when paired with the overwhelming presence of the golden heroic spirit. Those blood-red eyes looked as if they stripped away Saber's clothes just with their sight, licked and caressed her soft skin. What seeped out of his eyes was blatant lust. Although this inevitably stirred up Saber's impulse of immediately drawing her sword and go into battle, she could only endure it when she thought of Iris Veil. I am immensely thankful of your arrivals upon receiving my invitation. It was unclear whether he noticed the pressing presence of the three women, Tokiomi solicitously offered his opening speech. The heavens feel this time is also finally about to enter the most important stage. Right now. All that's left are the masters of the three families of the beginning, and one sudden intruder, then, do you of the Einsburn family have any thoughts on this battle situation? No. After answering thus with a cold and clear voice, Iris Vio continued to speak audaciously. We have the strongest saber, so there's no need to stealthily grasp every opportunity. Just walking towards victory like this would be enough. Is that so, with a provoking undertone? Tokiomi couldn't stop himself but laugh. Then, please allow me to speak of my own thoughts. Putting aside our respective strengths for now, let us talk about Berserker and Rider first. Of course, 
Our final goal is to let the three families of the beginning remain and therefore ensure the right of possessing the Grail in the final battle. However, very unfortunately, due to a strategic mistake of the Mado family, a servant that needs to spend large amounts of prana was summoned by a weak master. I fear that they would face their demise sooner or later. It seems the one that would obtain victory among them will be Ryder. I guess that you would also know something about the might of that heroic spirit Alexander. Tokyo me paused, waiting for Iris Veal to react. However, seeing that she remained silent, Tokyo me continued speaking. A newcomer who suddenly popped out of nowhere dares to stretch his hands towards the Holy Grail, in which two thousand years of longing were entrusted, does Ein's burn not feel very uncomfortable about this? Speaking of newcomers, aren't Tozikas and Mottos included in that too? Normally, Iris Veal will never speak so unscrupulously, but tonight's strategy was to completely suppress Tokiomi. When she discarded her daily gentleness and demureness and stood upright to confront, she seemed as inviolable as a beautiful and adamant queen. But Tokiomi wasn't going to succumb just with that. He still carried a solicitous smile, and his expression didn't waver a bit. Since what Ein's burn wishes for is only the fact of achieving the third magic, then would it fit your original intentions if you were to entrust the Holy Grail to me, Tozaka Tokiomi, with my goal of reaching Akasha? Hearing this, Iris Veal cast a contemptuous sneer towards Tokiomi. Could it be that the Tozaka family would even beg just to rob the Holy Grail from our hands? Huh. Although the explanation would make one doubt the questioner's moral character, it doesn't matter. The question now is that this guy who knows nothing about the Grail has the possibility of obtaining the final victory. I would definitely not allow the Holy Grail to fall into a layman's hands, our opinions should be the same on this point. To put it simply, the one that Tokyo Mi considers as most threatening is only Ryder. Iris Veal agrees with that point. Since she already understood the opponent's intent, then it would be about time for her to state her position. We Einsburn have never had the habit of uniting with others. A so-called alliance will only make others laugh, however, if you want to fight enemies one by one, we would also express our sincerity. Go on. Regard Tozaka as our enemy only after all other masters are defeated, we're willing to obey such an agreement. Iris Veal's roundabout way of speaking made Tokyo me nod his head coldly. That's to say, a ceasefire agreement with conditions attached. It's appropriate for both parties. We have two demands. As if trying to suppress the other and take the initiative, Iris Veal followed up, firstly, give us the information you have on Ryder's master. Tokyo Mi sniggered in his heart when he heard this. Since Ein's burn made such a demand, then it meant she really wanted to go defeat Ryder herself. This development was completely within his expectations. Kairi, tell them. Hearing Tokyo Mi's command Kairi, who had stayed aside and waited silently, began to explain with a flat tone. Ryder's master is an apprentice magus named Waver Velvet, who was studying under Kaneth. He now flats in the home of an old couple surnamed Mackenzie and Mama City, Nakago Tucho Mei. They are an ordinary family that has nothing to do with the heavens feel, but they think Waver is their own grandson under Waver's hypnosis magecraft. Kairi finished fluently. Hearing this, Iris via Landmia couldn't help but shiver. Although they've roughly guessed it, they didn't think that Kairi, who had once controlled Assassin, could undertake a war of intelligence so thoroughly. All right, what's the other condition? Tokyo Mi urged delightedly. Iris Veal stared straight at him with a solemn and heavy expression, and spoke with an uncompromising tone that didn't allow the opponent to decline. The second condition, is to eliminate Kotami and Kairi from the heavens feel. Tokyo Mi, who originally had a leisurely expression, couldn't help but gape when he heard this. However, Kairi remained nonplussed, and didn't even move his eyebrows. I didn't mean to kill him. I'm only saying that he needs to leave Fuayuki, no, leave Japan, before the war finishes. We hope that he'd depart tomorrow morning. Can you explain the reason? Tokyo Mi calmed the wavering of his heart and requested with a rather low voice. Iris Veal, who could tell people's emotions very clearly, believed more firmly that this pair of teacher and student has estrangements between them, 
It was obvious that Tokiomi did not know what Kairai did exactly. That executor has quite a feud with us signs burn. If Tozaka is to include him in your camp, then we would be completely unable to trust you. If so, then we would regard you as the target to be eliminated first, and unite with Ryder and the others to initiate attacking you. There wasn't a single hint of joking in Iris V. Eel's tone. Finally, Tokiomi detected that there were many things he didn't know, and cast a doubtful look towards Kairai, who was beside him. What's going on, Kairai? Kairai remained silent, expressionless as if wearing a mask. However, since he didn't make any rebuttal to Iris V. Eel's words, his silence was enough to explain the problem. With a sigh, Tokiomi once again hid his emotions in the bottom of his heart, and gazed at the Einsburn camp with a nonchalant expression. As the substitute of the late father Raisai, Kairai had inherited the job of the supervisor. If you believe that he must leave, then we have a condition too. Silently, Iris V. Eel inclined her head and motioned for him to continue. I observed last night's battle. That saber of yours has a noble phantasm with an overly powerful destructive power, we hope that you can restrain her use of it. Now Saber furrowed her brows. She understood that Tozaka wanted to forcibly push the duel with Ryder onto her. She could only regard this extra condition as being too unreasonable. Why are you interfering with our battle tactics? We are the managers of Fuayuki. If the Heavens Feel is going to leave the concealment of the Holy Church and proceed openly, then I hope unnecessary disturbances can be avoided. At this moment, Mia, who had been quiet until now, suddenly interrupted. Saber's noble phantasm caused damage to the surrounding structures last night? Dash luckily, it was minimal damage. Coincidentally, there was a large ship on the path of her attack. However, one mistake would have indeed flattened all the houses on the opposite river bank. It was us who placed the ship there. Hearing Mia's words, Saber's eyebrows twitched. Indeed, it was precisely because that ship was there that she was able to use Excalibur without worries. However, she only knew upon hearing Mia that it was actually prepared by Kiritsugu. On a side note, we've already confirmed that the owner of that ship has bought insurance. The Einsburn camp has already thoroughly considered the destructive power of Saber's noble phantasm without needing you to remind us. I'm asking you to put your so-called consideration into a treaty. Rather toughly, Tokyo Mi interrupted Mia's words. It is unconditionally forbidden to use noble phantasms on ground level in Fuayuki City. The same applies even if you're on air if it would indirectly cause harm to residents, can you agree to this condition, Einsburn Master? If I agree, then would Kotami and Kairai really leave Japan? Ah, I assure you of it, and can be held accountable. Tokiomi nodded without hesitation. Kairai, beside him couldn't let out his anger and could only gird his teeth tightly by himself. Iris V. Eo consulted Saber for her opinion. Saber nodded to show that she agreed. Saber also did not want her noble phantasm to create unnecessary sacrifices. This wouldn't count as exceeding restriction if Tozaka Tokiomi's concern was the same as hers. Very good. Since you confirmed that you can fulfill the condition, then we also agree to a ceasefire. After the meeting concluded, Kotami and Kairai remained in the church, which both masters have left, all by himself. Just like Tokiomi said then, Kairai, right now, as a member of the Holy Church, was proceeding with managing the aftermath all around Fuayuki City. Due to the death of his father, Raisai, who was the supervisor, the on-site command chain was completely fuddled and there was absolutely no time to wait for the assembly of the Eighth Sacrament to send in the official successor. However, the work at each scene was now progressing methodically after giving only appropriate directions to the management at each place. This showed that the orders Raisai made when he was alive was very much correct. Kairai's job was to continue along the trail that Raisai had already laid down and sends the duties down one by one, in truth. It wasn't anything particularly difficult. But right now he must make a decision concerning his work. Actually, for Kairai. He had already understood that his situation was dangerous when he sensed Tokiomi had the intention of making an alliance with the Einsburns. The decision that he made at the meeting just now wasn't surprising, either. The Einsburn women, and Emiya Kiritsugu, 
the true manipulator behind them, had gradually realized Kairai's threat towards them, whereas he was only an ordinary assistant for Tozaka Tokiomi. Therefore, the alliance with Ainsburn was more important to him than Kairai. Moreover, Tokiomi didn't know about the command seals that once again appeared on Kairai's arm and the existence of the command seals that were taken back for safekeeping and secretly inherited from Raizai. Nor had Kairai told him that Saber's real master, Emiya Kiritsugu, had yet to make an appearance, or that Mato Kiraya was saved. The fact that he was hiding such important information at this time meant that Kairai had already discarded his duties as Tokiomi's subordinate. Tokiomi would discover this sooner or later, right now Kairai didn't have the right to complain. After contacting the employees distributed everywhere by phone, Kairai returned to his room alone. He sat down on the edge of the bed, and felt the quietness and stillness of the empty church. Kairai questioned his own heart while he stared at the darkness. He had already asked himself like this thousands and tens of thousands of times in his life up until now. But this question was really pressing down on him tonight. Only, this time he had to come to an answer before dawn break. Just what, is my wish? Among the vast amount of information that the employees passed on while they were cleaning up the aftermath, there were two pieces of information that Kairai could not ignore. One, an adult male body that died in a weird fashion appeared before the public at the riverside where things have sunk into chaos after being stirred up by Castor's sea demon. The corpse was taken over by the Holy Church and avoided being handed over to the police. It could no longer be identified due to severe facial damage, but due to the traces of the command seals on its right hand it can be roughly determined that he was Castor's master, Ryu Rinasuk. Cause of death, large diameter rifle bullets with diameters of 30 mm or more, two shots. The other report was even more shocking. Just a few hours ago, the bodies of Kenneth L. Meloy Archibald and Sole Ui Nuada Risofia Ri were found within an abandoned factory on the outskirts of Shinto. The two bodies have similarly been discovered by church employees while patrolling and were dealt with. A discarded and signed self guys scroll was found at the scene. This was the naked evidence of the perpetrator having used despicable means to kill Lancer's master. Emilia Kiritsugu, this cruel and emotionless hunting machine was eliminating his opponents one by one. What he was afraid was that Kiritsugu was still continuing the war somewhere out there. Different from Kairai, who could only sit on the spot, perplexed, he was stepping towards the Holy Grail pressingly. This battlefield named Fuayuki made a man who had continuously devoted to hollow battles reemerge after a nine year long silence. However, before Kairai knew just what his intentions and reasons were, he has to leave here. What would that man pray for when he obtains the omnipotent wish-granting vessel? Would that answer really fill up the emptiness in Kairai's heart? Who, are you? He suddenly muttered to himself. He had once expected Emiya Kiritsugu with a premonition almost equal to prayers, expecting his answer. Now Kairai had a sense of danger. The image that crisscrossed his mind was that of the women who stood upright in front of Kiritsugu and protected him. Why would they risk their lives for Kiritsugu? Or was it that Kiritsugu had sunken solo, to the mundane degree of sharing his own goal with a third party? Kairai felt a presence stirring up in the deep quietness. The presence was approaching him from the corridor outside his door. Kairai had already become very familiar with this presence. Even if he was only walking silently, that heroic spirit did not hide the flamboyant majesty emanating out of him. Even if he were stepping into the realm of gods, he remained as obstinate and unrestrained as ever. Archer didn't knock and stepped into Kairai's room straight away. He sneered with a sarcastic and pitiful tone when he saw Kairai was deep in thought. What are you thinking of, even at this stage? There should be a limit on being slow. You let Tokiomi sensei go back on his own, Archer? I was with him until the house. Recently there were poisonous insects more treacherous than assassin lurking in the night. Kairai nodded. That Emiya Kiritsugu won't ignore the meeting just then, he would definitely seek an opportunity to act during Tokiomi's journey to or back from the meeting. Kairai had briefed someone thoroughly about that point, not to Tokiomi, but to Archer, however, you really are an honest guy. 
knowing that your situation is getting worse but still worried about the safety of your Lord. This is a logical decision. I had long finished my duty of being Tokyo Mi Sensei's tool, and there were no reasons left to keep staying at Fuayuki. You don't really think that, right? Archer's gaze seemed to have seen through everything. Silently, Kairi gazed back at him. However, Kairi didn't plan to rebuke, because what Archer said wasn't wrong. Otherwise, he wouldn't be sitting here idiotically, and would already be making preparations for leaving Fuayuki. Even now, the Holy Grail is still calling to you, and you yourself are also longing to keep on fighting. Archer said thus. Kairi remained silent, and gave up on rebuttal. No matter what he says, there's nothing to hide in front of Archer. That heroic spirit had even seen through the fact that he was only deceiving everyone including himself. Then, maybe the answer that Kairi had always sought was also already within his heart. It was as if those twin red eyes were gazing from above at little white mice, wandering lost and perplexed. There was no inducement, nor was there salvation, maybe appreciating others' worries was something that made the king of heroics delighted. Ever since I can remember, I've been looking into one question. As if confessing to the darkness within his heart, Kairi stood in front of Archer. Wasting time, enduring the pain. But everything ended in fruitlessness. However, right now I feel that I have never been closer to the answer. What I seek must be at Fuayuki, at the end of the war. After he said those words, Kairi once again understood just what drove him to walk on till today. It was a long time ago, when Kotami and Kairi was yet to be Tozaka Tokiomi's hound. The Kairi back then continuously stirred up dissent just for himself. Since you've reflected so much, then why are you perplexed? Archer asked coldly. Hearing this, Kairi lowered his head and looked at his open hands, then covered his face as if going to sigh. I have an ominous premonition, I would walk towards annihilation when I have obtained all the answers. If the expectation that was endowed on Amiya Kiritsugu was not fulfilled, and if he couldn't find something else in Mato Karayu's end either, then, Kairi could no longer turn back, he could only face it. He could only try to face the thing that he discovered in the deaths of his father and wife. It would be better for him to just turn around and leave. Be Tozaka Tokiomi's deferent disciple until the end and obediently leave. That way, it would at least look better on the face of it. And forget everything from now on. Don't ask anything, don't demand anything, and pass through a busy but mundane life like a plant would. No matter what he had lost, this would at least let him rest in peace. Don't think of those boring things, idiot. Archer's reminder interrupted the thought that he had almost been prepared to fulfill. You won't be troubled until now if you could change your way of life so easily. You, who's used to questioning while you're alive, would die with questions at the end too. You won't receive the answer, and can't rest in peace. Maybe I should congratulate you. You're finally going to arrive at the destination after such a lengthy journey. You would congratulate someone else, Archer? Archer inclined his head. There was still no sentimentality on his face, but it was sparkling with an innocent and joyous light like a child observing an anthill. I should have told you that observing humanity's cause and retribution is the most interesting entertainment. I, the king, full-heartedly looks forward to the moment when you come face to face with your destiny. The king of heroes said this gallantly. Hearing this, Kairi gave a bitter laugh. Is it really so fun to live so stubbornly for the greed of enjoyment? If you're jealous, you can try to live a little like this too. You won't fear annihilation once you comprehend just what is enjoyment. The phone in the priest's office in the corridor outside rang. As if he had already predicted it, Kairi did not appear to be surprised in any way. He walked out of the room, picked up the receiver, and quickly disconnected the phone after just a few words and returned to the room. What's wrong? It's a call from the employees of the Holy Church who originally worked under my father. They now have to report everything to me. Seeing that Kairi's expression was unusually relaxed, Archer furrowed his brows and asked. Are there some good news? You could say that. This news is quite decisive. After this, Kairi hesitated for a while, considering whether he should say it. However, at the end, he still chose confession. 
I sent people to follow those from the Einsburn camp after the end of the recent meeting. I told them it was my father's order given before he passed away, so they went and did so. Thanks to that, I found out the place where those three are currently hiding. After Archer heard Kyrie through, he couldn't help but be stunned for a little while. Then the King of Heroes laughed heartily. He clapped continuously. Honestly Kyrie, you really are Dash. Haven't you already made up your mind ages ago? He was still using his own position to detect the movements of the enemy camps, so it would be impossible for him not to join the fight. While Kyrie was being anxious, the battle strategy had made concrete advancements. But he had not made the mental preparations just then, just a few minutes ago. I was lost once, and had also wanted to give up. But at the end, King of Heroes, it's like what you said, someone like me can only live on with questions. As Kairi spoke, he rolled up his sleeves and confirmed the command seals on his arms. There were two command seals on his left lower arm. Command seals that would allow Kairi to make a contract once again with a servant. Meanwhile, the command seals that were taken back for safekeeping and inherited from his father covered his entire right arm. The innumerable command seals, yet to confirm a target for a contract, can be used and forged into highly practical prana that has no alignments, and can be used to restrain servants as well. That means they can be used as mock magic crests. Apart from the fact that they are expandable. The Magecraft that Kairi now possessed was enough to rival famous Magecraft houses that have collected their crests through the generations. Kairi's preparation was more than enough for him to continue participating in the Heaven's Feel that was still going on. There were no greater good and no illusionary glories on the road before him. A battle that only belonged to Kotami and Kairi was about to start. In order to fill his own nihility, in order to confirm the capacity of his own emptiness, he would question Amiya Kiritsugu, question Mato Karaya, and question the wish-granting vessel, the Holy Grail. Ha 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 ha, however, Kairi, although it's a bit abrupt, I have a few questions. Archer laughed madly and arrogantly. Those blood-red eyes were permeating with the implications of a prank, and at the same time carried an evil shade. If you've really decided to participate in the War of the Holy Grail, then you would become Tozaka Tokiomi's enemy. That's to say, right now you're staying defenselessly in the same room with the enemy's servant. Isn't this very awful? Not necessarily, I do still have ways to keep myself alive. Oh? Archer, interested, narrowed his eyes. Kairi spoke calmly. Since now I am already opposing Tokiomi sensei, then I don't need to hide his lies anymore, Gilgamesh. Let me tell you the truth of the heavens feel that you don't know about. What did you say? Hearing this, Archer furrowed his brows with perplexity. Kyra proceeded to speak thoroughly of the truth of the heavens feel that he got to know from Tokiomi. The miracle that occurs in the inside of this world cannot be used universally on the outside of the world. The fight over the wish granting vessel is only a camouflage, the three noble families of the beginning has other plans. The ceremony that had originally been held in Fuayuki was a kind of attempt to use the souls of seven heroic spirits as sacrifices to open the road that leads to the root. The promise of fulfill a miracle was also only bait used to attract heroic spirits. However, as the result of the unilateral spread of this bait, the current heavens feel had lost its original meanings and is only left with an empty shell. This is a secret known only to the Matos, Tozukas and Dinesburns and people related them. The foreign masters and all of the servants are oblivious to this truth. This time around, the only Magus who wants to fulfill the once long cherished wish of the three noble families of the beginning is Tozaka Tokiomi. He wants to kill all seven servants to activate the Greater Grail. That's right, kill all seven. Do you understand? Dash that's why Tokiomi Sensei was so stingy with the expenditure of command seals. He can only use two command seals in the battle with other masters. He needs to use the final one that's left to order his own servant to commit suicide once everything is finished. Archer heard him through without interruption, then questions with a lowered voice and with an extremely apathetic expression. You're telling me that the loyalty Tozaka Tokiomi had shown to me were all to deceive me? Kairi knows his teacher's character. Therefore, he slowly shook his head. 
he indeed does have the uttermost respect for Gilgamesh, king of heroes. However, it's completely different for the servant archer. That's to say, you're only a representation, a meaning not too far off from a statue or a portrait. Everyone who walks past it would give it a respectable look of admiration if it's put at the most conspicuous place in a gallery, but if this representation was removed when the collection is being rotated off, then it would be despised. That's to say, Tokio Mi Sensei is a complete magus at the end. For him, a servant is just a tool. He had once calmly told me that even if he admires heroic spirits, he won't harbor any illusions towards idols. Here in Kairi's account, Archer nodded dramatically as if suddenly realizing something, then once again showed that evil smile he had beforehand. There was cruelty within tolerance, decisiveness within boldness, it was the smile of a king who was an absolute existence, who could decide everything with just one word. Tokyo me, today I've finally discovered your worth. Even that boring man can make me so delighted. If viewed from the meanings hidden beneath those words, this was definitely a tragic declaration enough to freeze someone's blood. King of Heroes, what do you plan to do? Will you still show loyalty to Tokyo Mi Sensei even so, and punish my betrayal? Yes, what should I do? Although he has been disloyal to me, Tokyo Mi is after all my prana provider. Moreover, where would I get a perfect master? Archer stopped speaking, and suddenly gazed at Kairi with a cold expression. Ah, speaking of. It seems like there is a master here who had obtained command seals, but had lost his servant. You speak the truth. Using a smile to reply to Archer's naked lore, Kairi lowered his head. But does that man have the worth to be graced with the favor of the King of Heroes? No problems. Although it's not flawless, there is enough potential. Maybe he'd even be able to let me thoroughly enjoy myself. Like so. At that moment, the final master and servant chosen by fate exchanged smiles to each other for the first time. It was lost in an abyss of shallow slumber within the darkness sealed in the bottomless earth. What it dreamt of in the shallow slumber, was the endless prayers, unreasonable and unattainable, that have been entrusted a long time ago. A beautiful world. A beautiful life. A flawless soul. Because such longings were too strong so they had to entrust all other evils to one place, that was the wish of the fragile men. Through answering that prayer, it had once saved a world. There is no evil apart from me. This is no imperfection apart from me. I am the only one who should be hated. I am the only one who should be abhorred. Like thus, it saved the world, and let them obtain peace. Therefore dash it was not a saint who saved men and aided the world. Without praises without reverence, without tributes, but only with spurns, only curses, only disdain. Before it knew it, even its name as a human had been rubbed away, only left with a title of its way of existence, and finally became a concept that was passed down through the ages. Until now, all that had already became a dream of memories that had had its full share of time's baptism. Just how much time had passed since then? Right now. It was thinking dazedly on top of the bed it had slept on peacefully. It felt like some complicated changes had occurred. That's right, it was about 60 years ago. Something had happened almost in the blink of an eye. Because it happened so suddenly, it didn't understand everything completely, when it came to, it was already at a place like a mother's warm placenta. An infinite darkness that sighed in the deepest place beneath the earth. Back then, it had been a place that had concealed an egg that had endless possibilities. One day, like a seed, it entered and planted its roots into this place. From that day on, that place because the abdominal cavity that nurtured a darkness that didn't belong to anything, veritably became a uterus with the purpose of fostering it into maturity. Since then, it had surely absorbed the prana that flew in from the ley lines in the earth like a baby that obtained nourishment from the mother's placenta while it slept in its shallow slumber. While it veritably grew, it waited without being discovered by anyone for the arrival of an opportunity. Waiting to one day leave this scorching profound darkness, the moment of delivery. Suddenly, it dash perked up its ears and listened for the sound coming from near it. Just then, someone really did speak all the evils of this world. It won't matter. Gladly accept it. Ah, uh, 
someone was calling it. Blessing and itself were both called by someone. Answer him. It must be able to write now. The prana whirlpool that had swelled long ago to an incomparable size in the darkness gave it a concrete form. The endless prayers that had been entrusted in the distant past should also be able to be fulfilled right now. An existence like something that was preyed upon. Going to do all the things that were wished for. All the pieces of the puzzle had been assembled. The gears of fate grinded together, and were now turning bravely, accelerating with the day of completion as their goal. All that's left, was waiting for the birthing canal to open. As it dreamed in its shallow slumber, it emitted cries that will dye the world crimson red. It also repeated its contractions in the darkness beneath the earth, unknown to anyone else. Postface, Tanaka Romeo the third volume of Fate, Zero has launched its attack. Is everyone prepared? Reading is an act of invading the book, and we would normally finish our manipulation of it with the conclusion of our read. Like so, we recall the story in our memories as we discuss it logically. This is the way adults read. But sometimes this rule also shatters. Originally planning to read the book, but got read by the book for no apparent reason. Although planning to manipulate, I was already being manipulated when I realized it. Something like this had happened while reading Fate, Zero Volume 3. Without needing further explanation, this book is a spin-off of the monstrous visual novel Fate, Stay Night. This is a volume that incorporated the situation that had appeared and continuously proceeded and became more torturous in the previous volumes, and also included signs of an even more tremendous and eventful future. The volume of change in the entire flow of beginning, continuation, changes and conclusion. The author is the superstar of the PC gaming world, famous for his subtle way of writing, Yurabuchi Gen. Through reading this book, you must have strongly felt the style of the creator of the fate world, Nasuki Noko san, with those poignant and powerful words. At the same time, for those who are very familiar with Yurabuchi Gen, you should have also smelt the very thick Urabuchi scent between the passages that he had so delicately recreated in the style of the original work. Exquisite. Overwhelmingly exquisite. Had it been his own literary work, his own topic, on his own grounds, such exquisiteness would have been understandable. However, for Urabuchi to be able to achieve such exquisiteness on someone else's home ground is simply extraordinary. This is especially so for the work of fate. One must have extraordinary powers in order to dexterously use its world view. I've been attentive to Yurabuchi from his first work till Jin activities, therefore I have been familiar with him for a long time. However, his performance in Fate, Zero still made me stunned. The more I read, the more I felt envious of him. It was evidently interesting, but there was also a bitter taste. I fell into a state of intertwined bitterness and joy. Words as neat as artworks in those boiling, igniting souls showed to be perfection of a higher class. I sighed with feeling when I finished reading the entire book. You readers who can simply enjoy its fun are truly blessed. Alright, here ends the envy of a fellow author, and I'll talk a little about my personal thoughts. Actually, it wasn't just one or two kinds of sentiments that boils up after the reading. If I want to avoid clumsily laying out pretty words, then I can only judge it coldly and impartially, while also being able to randomly write out what I thought of in my heart. Let's touch upon it briefly in the range allowed without spoiling it for you. The third volume is the volume of change in the story, and portrayed all sorts of happenings. Thinking of those things, and these things. And even such things? Bullying Saber is progressing extremely well. Again, writer, you. Waver Tilda. A rebound attack? No, no, that. That's right, a waste of efforts. It's really too much. Lancer. El Meloy. Gilgami SH, accepted the invitation, that's how it is. Not understanding it at all, no, it must be under the condition of not having spoilers. After all, after I read all that, I couldn't control myself. I went out. Although I felt like a Ferrari. Unfortunately a Ferrari only exists in my imagination, and I could only walk with the feet my parents gave me. There were no destinations. Just casually strolling. 
once in a while casting a vigilant look at pedestrians who hurried past me. My eyes beamed as I looked at the building roofs. Checking if I was being followed. Why do all that? Obviously. Because maybe the participants of the Holy Grail War were hidden amongst them. Yes. I planned to conduct the Holy Grail War within my brain. That was really tiresome. But that's alright. Today happened to be of good weather. Therefore, in a moment of carelessness, my noble phantasm personal delusions was accelerated. Fate, Zero is truly fearsome.